Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be here with all of you tonight to celebrate Nicola Griffith's brand new book, Spear. Spear is um, an unforgettable queer Arthurian retelling or just telling, really, um, for our modern era. It is a spellbinding vision of the Camelot we've longed for, a Camelot that belongs to us all. And we're joined by Edward Austin Hall, who co-edited the 2013 anthology Mothership, Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond, which the magazine of fantasy and science fiction suggested in 2015 might be one of the most important science fiction anthologies of the decade. That estimation resonated in 2021 when Mothership appeared in a story headline, Sci-Fi Has Changed a Lot in the Past Decade, These Seven Reads Will Show You How, which ran on NPR.org's main page. Hall's first novel, Dread Isle, was published by Gumbo House in December of 2020, and you can go back to Karis's YouTube page and check out our event with Ed in celebration of Dread Isle, and of course you can buy Dread Isle from Karis tonight. And the person of the hour is Nicola Griffith. She is a dual UK-US citizen living in Seattle. She is the author of seven award-winning novels, including Hild and Ammonite, and her shorter work has appeared in Nature, New Scientist, New York Times, etc. She's the founder and co-host of Hashtag Cripplet, holds a PhD from Angela, Angela sorry, Anglia Ruskin University, and enjoys a ferocious bout of wheelchair boxing. She is married to novelist and screenwriter Kelly Eskridge. You can follow her on Twitter and visit her website. I'll put those in the chat. And this is a really fun kind of old home week because Nicola used to live in Atlanta. And we were just talking about her Atlanta books, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but also, uh, she mentioned that she and Ed are celebrating a friendship anniversary. They have been friends for at least 30 years, perhaps 31. Um, and it's one of my favorite things as um, a bookseller to get to have friends be in conversation about books. So I'm delighted to have you both here and I want to encourage folks who are watching at home, feel free to ask questions if you like, or just sit back and enjoy the conversation. Um, it's a great, great Saturday night thing to do. So welcome to you both and special welcome to Nicola. We're so glad to have you back at Karis. Thank you. It's Thank wonderful you. to be here and it's great to be here with Ed because uh, that's we met in Atlanta uh, in April, actually, of, it was either 91 or 92. And Ed just marched up and said, hello, and introduced himself and things went from there. So it's great to be back here. It's so good to see you, Nicola. Are you hearing an echo? No? 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 Good. No. Um, well, Nicola, I think you, we talked about you uh, starting off with a reading mm -hmm. from Spear, sure. so yes. please do. Okay, well, um, Spear is set in 6th century Wales in a world in which King Arthur existed and magic walked the earth. In the wild waste, a girl growing. A girl at home in the wild, in the leafless thicket of thin grey saplings with moss growing green on one side. In this thicket, the moss side does not face north. The moss side does not face north, but curves in a circle with its back to the world. And at its centre, where the branches grow most tangled and forbidding, is a hill. In the face of that hill, Always hidden from the world is the dark mouth of the cave where the girl lives with her mother. As far as the girl can tell, none on two legs but herself and her mother has ever trod here. Her mother will creep from the cave only as far as the gardens at the edge of the thicket, and then only in summer when the leaves are cloak enough to hide the sunburnished bronze of her hair when the hard enamel blue of her eyes might be mistaken for forget-me-nots. But the girl is at home in all the wild. She roams the whole of Ustrad Toei, the valley abandoned in the long ago. In this valley, where there is a tree, she will climb it, 
it will shelter her, and the birds that nest there in spring will sing to her warning of any two-legged approach. In May, as the tree blossom falls and herbs in the understory flower, she will know by the scent of each how it might taste with what meat, whether it might heal, who it could kill. From its nectar she will know which moths will come to drink, know two of the bats that catch the moths, and what nooks they return to where they will hang wrapped in their leather shrouds as the summer sun climbs high, high enough to shine even into the centre of the thicket. Before harvest, when the bee hum spreads drowsy and heavy as honey, she tastes in their busy drone a tale of the stream over which they skim, the falls down which the stream pours, the banks it winds past, where reeds grow thick and the autumn bittern booms. And when the snow begins to fall once again, she catches a flake on her tongue and feels, lapping against her belly, the lake it was drawn from by summer sun far away. A lake like a promise she will one day know. Then, as the world folds down for winter, so too do the girl and her mother, listening to the crackle of flame and, beyond the door curtain, the soft hiss of snow settling over the hills and hollows like white felt. In the cave is a great hanging bowl. My cup! her mother calls it when she tells her stories. On warm days, bright, precious days, when her mother will venture outside under the sun, beckon a bird to her finger and sing with it its song, the cup is a gift to the laughing blue-eyed Ellen from her lover, the girl's father with grey-green eyes like the sea. On these days, her mother calls the cup, calls the girl Dowan Ged, her blessing, her gift and favour. The girl likes this name, and these days, when the bowl is just a bowl, and they work together in the garden while her mother tells her tales of the Tuha Day, the she-gods who came to Eoru over the sea with four great treasures, one each from the four islands of the overland that drowned. The Tuha are forever squabbling over the treasures. But the stories changed with the weather. On dark autumn days, when the wind moaned and stripped the last forlorn leaves from the trees, when it fretted and worried at their peace, thrusting its tongue deep into their warm cave, trying to lick them out as the girl had seen a badger lick out ants from a tree, on those days her mother grew gaunt and strange. The child would wake in the night at her mother's dream cries, a man coming to steal her, steal her child, steal her payment and her mother would not eat, only hunch over the bowl and scry, and follow the girl about with haunted eyes. On these days, Ellen calls the girl Tal, her payment, because I am owed, Tal, I am owed. He owes me, yes, for possessing my soul and my mind. And the other owes me, too, because he knew, oh, he knew what manner Nan would do. But they will never find us, no. We will stay hidden, we will stay safe, and they will never know your true name. She will never say what the girl's true name is, or who the other was, and the stories are never the same, and always the cave is hidden. The bowl is not gold, it is not silver, nor even beaten bronze, it is enamel on black iron that never dulls and never dents, though sometimes the iron shimmers with light reflected from elsewhere. Even direct from the hearth it will not burn the hand that holds it, and any who drink from it are healed. Or so Ellen tells the girl. The girl herself cannot tell because she drinks and eats from the bowl every day. But every day she grows tall and taller, strong and stronger. Her hair with the same heavy wave as her mother, but paler, brass where her mother is bronze. Her eyes grey with a hint of green. The girl grows fleet. She runs with the deer. 
She learns to hunt with calf links of the tufted ears, bathing in the joy of the stork and the savage leap. She hunts too with traps and slings and stone, and with her one knife honed to a bright shard. She no longer weeps when she takes the fawn or the hare, for she and her mother must eat, though more than once she has left the leveret in its scrape and wished the slow-eyed hare the best for her young. As she grows and her legs stretch, she roams farther. She ranges a mile, a league, three leagues, ten. It is wild land, long abandoned to the wet and the cold, and, since the red crests left, claimed by no king, though once it was and one day would be again. She climbs an elm, whose new leaves taste like sorrel, an elm with no name but elm. Sometimes Elm rocks her gently to sleep in the late spring breeze or whispers to her of how it is to grow from a sapling, to draw water from deep in the earth, to feel the world turn season after season. And once Elm shows her the hidden sparrow hawk that waits silently with marigold eyes for the missile thrush to leave the safety of his nest. I'll stop there for now. Oh. Ed, your uh, microphone's off. It looks Thanks. like it disconnected, Ed. We just need to reconnect, I think. Can you hover over your picture with your mouse? It, that's not, it, it seems to be an, a more, a deeper problem, Ed. Mm. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just chat for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so yes, can you just tell us a bit about, about where this began? Sure. Yeah, um, so that, that, the scene I read is the beginning of the book and I chose, the beginning to give you a sense of how our hero who eventually does get a name and her name is Peritia, how she grows up. I mean, she, she grows up with this really traumatized mother and she grows up alone with this woman in the wild, in a cave. I mean, she doesn't even know other people exist. She grows up wholly innocent really of the ways of the world and she's taught very much by nature she's taught by the trees um by the hedgehogs the ducks the lynx and she really learns to fend for herself but as she grows old, older she roams further around this wild valley and she encounters people um beginning to move back into the valley. And she learns that there, there are other people in the world a bit like her, not entirely like her because some of them are men and she's a little confused by that because she's only ever known her mother. Um, and so she, she just learns by observing. So she's very a very hidden person to start with. And she learns to really take care of herself. And she, she institutes a kind of, hmm, think of it as involuntary barter. She basically steals things from these other people and then gives them things that they need that only she can provide. So it's a, it's a, it's a hidden kind of negotiation that goes on. She doesn't steal steal, but it is an involuntary barter. So are you back with us now, Ed? I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Excellent. Um, Nicola, you have a great set of notes at the back of the mm -hmm. book that talk about its creation and and uh, and your history with the Arthurian stuff. Uh, and it looked it, your gateway drug into King Arthur, as it were, was um, Le Mort d'Arthur, right? Mm -hmm. Can you? What are your recollections of it, if any? My um. 
Now, I just want to be clear that my recollection is probably completely made up because yeah. I was quite young. Because my, my library had this uh, policy where it basically, if you could reach a book, you were old enough to read it. And so I would tippy-toe, tippy-toe. And I was very good at jumping also. So <laughs> I sort of accessed books that probably weren't always my age range. So I think I was about eight when I read this book. And of course, it's written in very ye olde language -y. Um So I'm not entirely sure how much I understood at the time. I believe, though, that it was an illustrated version. And I think the combination of the text and the illustrations are what really set me off down the Arthurian road. Because hmm. there was this real sense of... of the landscape of the long ago, the mist on the moors, the the sky with no contrails in it, and landscape with no metalled roads, no smell of exhaust. And more to the point, this kind of sense of, of these dark and forbidding tangled woods at each side of the road. So all you have to do is take one step and you're in a different mm. place. Yeah. So that was the beginning for me. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I loved the, the heroism. I love, I've always loved any story where people gallop about on horses and whack each other's heads off with swords. I'm like, that's my kind of thing. <laughs> um, so there was that. Um, uh -huh. I, didn't I didn't understand the romance and love and gooshy stuff. I'm like, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also loved loved the notion of Camelot, mm -hmm. where everyone was fighting for, I think mostly it was characterized as, as the light, you know, as, as civilization against the encroaching barbarism. There was this sense of it, you know, the last redoubt of civilization against the incoming mm -hmm. chaos. Yeah. So I, I think Camelot for me was a an anti chaos place, okay. and I really liked that. Yeah. You talk about your perception of national origin stories, which you uh, which includes of the Arthurian saga, um, and. And, and I think you've indicated that these are problematic. <laughs> to put it mildly. And to put yes. it mildly. So to you know, yeah. talk about that too, would you? Sure. Um, the matter of Britain from which the whole Arthur legend is taken, um, it begins with, basically it, it comes from Geoffrey of Monmouth. He, he wrote, the, the beginning of the matter of Britain. And his notion, uh, he wrote his story, uh, the history of the kings of Britain, basically, is what it's called in English as opposed to Latin. And it's this racy hodgepodge of stuff. And it begins with Brutus of Troy. Uh, basically, he escapes from <laughs> the Aeneid and, and comes to Britain and uh, founds Britain, and Britain is called Britain because of Brutus. So there you go, that's why Britain is called Britain. And it goes on from there, and he was essentially, uh, he was writing in Latin, but he was essentially a Norman, he was from France, and he was a monk. So he had all this um, Christian overlay, and he was also writing a kind of, apologia of why the Normans deserved to rule the quote Anglo-Saxons. So it begins with this, this is why we are the real people and should be in charge and why you should obey us because we are the natural heirs of Arthur who ruled everything and was amazing. And then this this real linkage of Arthur with virtue and um, moral authority. 
Um, so that's, it, it began there. And ever since, the English particularly have really used it as an excuse for empire. Uh, I mean, Wales was England's first colony. And the first time you get a member of an English royal family using the name Arthur was when they were trying to really, really grind the Welsh under their heel. And if you just look, and this has continued through all the centuries, so now, living right now, three members of the current British royal family, Charles, William, and William's second son, Louis, all have Arthur in their name. It's like, we're kings because we come from Arthur because from Arthur, Arthur is this Helens. moral authority. And, he, you know, if you go back even to... Um, Tennyson, you look at Idylls of the King, it's just a song of empire. It's just about how these straight, white, non-disabled, manly men who are, are born to rule. They're the, the, the nobility, English nobility, is born to be better than anybody else. And everybody else should be bloody grateful that they're in charge because they can show them where they need to go. So, yeah, I mean, I I never wanted to write one of these stories. I mean, I loved, <laughs> I loved, I love the legend and I, I've read so much of it, but I never wanted to write it. I never, never, never dreamed of writing it because of all these problems. I just thought writing the kind of story I wanted to write that I would want to read and still, it's still feeling Arthurian. I thought that was impossible, so I didn't try. Well, I, I'll I'll speak to my own experience of King Arthur here. Um, you uh, right, Mallory's your gateway drug. I have vague images in my head of the Disney version of Sword in the Stone. Oh yeah, yeah, T. H. White. Yeah, but the first Arthurian thing that I sat through all the way through and is, it remains my touchstone for King Arthur is of course, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> so there's no way, right? In fact, I had, I, I won't name names here, but I was chided and basically silenced uh, by admitting that I've never read T.H. White. And I, I mean, as you say, this material doesn't really, include people like me and yet you and and other people there there's a there's a movement involving this now this kind of well the middle ages weren't really as uh all all, all white all the time and unvaried as some people would like us to believe. so They totally about, weren't. No. Yeah, so I talk mean, about why. Talk about why and how that results in this book of yours. Okay, well, um, this book is set in the 6th century. So it's, it's very early Middle Ages. Um, what used to be called the Dark Ages and is still, depending on what your field is, can be called sub-Roman Britain or late antiquity, but I just call it the early Middle Ages, sort of sixth and seventh century. And every single Arthurian story you read, all these people were white, which is just such bullshit, it pisses me off. Just think, the Romans, they were a huge empire. They, they, they ruled all of North Africa, they ruled, everything around the Mediterranean. They ruled um, through the Sarmatians and Constantinople and they were everywhere. They talk about multicultural and the Romans did not have the same kind of uh, appreciation or lack of for skin color. Skin color was not important to them. It was about 
who who are your people we don't care what color your people are but do we know your people um so they were snobs but just not skin color snobs and if you look at how they organized their military in particular i mean they conquered britain and they kept um, a heavy military presence at the borders, so particularly along Hadrian's Wall, which is not too far from where I was born and brought up. And the kind of people that they had there uh, in, the, in the empire, they would take recruits from a different part of empire and take them to a troubled place because they didn't want to recruit locals because they would be part of the trouble. So along Hadrian's Wall, you had people of of every creed and color, really. It was very multicultural. Um, you just have to look at, at the inscriptions and the gravestones. And then leaping a few centuries from there, because we don't have much in the way of written records in between, we get to um, Canterbury in the late seventh century and the abbot there was African and the archbishop was, um, he was Greek. And so Britain <laughs> is heavily mixed. It always has been. This notion of this pure white Anglo-Saxon stuff, it is, it's kind of obscene to me. It's just really wrong. But the interesting thing is if you look at some of the early legends, like um, I don't think it was Chrétien. It might have been someone right around that time. They introduce a knight who is, um, he's from the Middle East somewhere, so he's definitely not a white guy. And, you know, Within a hundred years, all the art representing that knight, whose name escapes me right now, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he's white in the art. It's like this in it's like this constant whitewashing over and over and over again. It's quite astonishing to watch. I mean, of course, women are used to that. We're, we're, you know, and I, mm -hmm. most of us are used to this who aren't the, the straight white non-disabled boys. Um, we get airbrushed out of everything and I think yes there there now is I'm seeing it all over in all kinds of genres this putting us back where we belonged and Spear for me is very much a response to that it's I love this legend I love the long ago I hate the fact that people like me are not seen in the long ago but you know crips queers people of color um we've we've always been around so we're we're here now we were there then so i put put us in the story i mean i just think it's much more hist i mean if you think about arthur in historical terms at all then my version is much more historically accurate than most because there are real people in it um Somehow, I thought this might be later than the novel of yours that precedes it. But it am I am I confused here? Does this take place at the same time that Hild is? Set? No, this this takes place uh, nearly a hundred years earlier. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you mentioned the African, uh, was he a? He was an uh, abbot. Abbot. Mm. Yeah, uh, that rang a bell. I was like, wait, where was that? What was that character in Hild? But yeah. No, no, yeah, no, that character wasn't in Hild. The, the character in Hild yeah. is uh, James the Deacon. And mm -hmm. we have no idea yeah. what color he was or, or where yeah. he was from. So, But you just made him black because made him black it because wasn't impossible. Not? That's yeah. right. Why not? Exactly. I love that approach. And, you know, I, I had a question about, and so what did you do to avoid the pitfalls of, right, Arthuriana? But I think you already answered that question. Mm. But um, Peritier was re really 
the key to that. Yeah. The fact that she grew up so innocent or, or perhaps naive. And so she didn't internalize societal prejudice. She she mm -hmm. it, it never occurred to her that that being a woman and having a sword would be a problem. It never occurred to her that her being a woman and loving other women would be a problem. It never occurred to her to think about disabled people or people of color as anything unusual because she didn't grow up with other people. So she's a complete blank slate in this way. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my ways in to uh, just sort of sidestepping all this mm -hmm. nonsense that's accreted over the years. And for, for people who uh, a, a lot of the names are, they're basically Welsh in the story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So oh, sorry, mostly, Welsh, this, mostly Welsh, mostly There's Welsh, mostly Welsh, a Greek person and a, an Asturian. Yeah. Uh, it finally, I saw Astur, Astur, Astur. And finally it hit me at near the end of my second reading of the book. I said, oh, they're Asturians. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so someone has a question about, Percival. So Peritor is Peritor Percival, is that right? Yes, uh, the equivalent of um, Peritor really is is mentioned. The first mention of Peritor is in about six, the sixth century. There are all kinds of Welsh tales, mm -hmm. um, but. For me, I mean, the reason I knew my story was about Peritia slash Percival was the the vision I first had before I started writing this story. I had this, um, I'd been asked to write a short story for an anthology, uh, a race-bent, um, gender-bent Arthurian retellings. And um, and I said no, because I didn't think it could be done. But then they asked me again, and I was about to say no again, when this image dropped in my head of this person on a bony horse with tatty, tatty armor, a broken sword, and in, in the dark wood looking kind of tired and used up. But the spear was red, and, and I saw this sort of not rich person and read and instantly went to the story of Percival, who was also raised in a not rich household, raised alone by his mother, and then fought the Red Knight. And so the two things came together in my head. And, and I would seen this vision and I'd seen the armor and I thought, that is old fashioned, that is not plate armor. That, so that's not Percival in the 14th century. This is way, this is way early. So it must be Peritia. So, and then all this stuff drops in my head about how I could bring in Irish mythology as well as Welsh history, as well as British legend. So that was another way to kind of widen the center, take it away mm. from just English people. Now it's all really British, which is mm -hmm. slightly better. I mean, it's still not great, but slightly better. And of course, the very name Peritia really helped with these, the four treasures of the Two Hard Day. I don't know. Do you want me to talk about Two Hard Day? Yeah. Or? Okay. Uh, well, talk about the four treasures and the... And, and the yeah. Yeah, okay, so the two hard day are basically the she, and they have four treasures. They have a cauldron, uh, a sword, a stone, and a spear. And obviously the, the first three are really easy to map onto Arthurian legend. You've got Excalibur, you've got the stone, Excalibur's Pultron, and you have the grail. They map really easily. But the spear, it's like, where on earth does the spear fit? But I'd been doing a lot of research for the, the novel I was working on when I first had this idea. Um, so I'd done, been doing a lot of etymological, philological research. 
about the, the origins of language. And I had learned enough Welsh to realize that peritia comes from bear, which means hard, and huthir, which means spear, hard spear. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, whoa, peritia could be the spear. And so everything went from there and it was kind of cool. So yes, Perita is Percival and is not Percival. So I hope you have answered your question. No, that's good. That, and that also hard spear, that would reflect the original title of the work, yes? Yes, the original title of this was Spear Enduring. Mm -hmm. But then my editor said, well, it's a bit Viagra-y, don't you think? <laughs> I said, Perfect. no, it's okay. And I said, you know, people will make jokes. I said, no, there are jokes in the book about that. It's okay. It's a run joke. But no, no, they didn't want that. So I said, okay, we'll just call it Spear. Bye. Well, um, because you brought up Excalibur, I should say here, the, the one time before reading this book, I had this sort of, you know, mind blown Arthurian thing come to me. You make reference to it in Spear when you talk about the Sky Stone. And that is, right? This is the idea that the sword from the stone is not yanking a sword that's embedded in a rock. It's who it was who figured out how to extract iron from meteorite metal. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a different and, kind. You get a different kind of steel. You get really high. You get high grade steel, not just yeah. iron. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, Jack White, W H Y T E, wrote mm -hmm. a whole series about of Arthurian books that begin with making Excalibur from a meteorite. Yeah. So. That is, you know, as I say in, in the author's note, I mean, basically, I've ripped off everybody in this book and I had the best time doing it. Hey. It's like a whole series of Easter eggs. I mean, if you've read widely in Arthurian fiction, you could have enormous fun with this book, just going through and going, tick. I should really make a little bingo card for this that people, <laughs> nice I haven't thought about, I should do a bingo card for people to tick off things. Oh, huh. Oh, uh, well, so where are we with time? We're almost at 40 minutes. Nicola, I, for me, your masterpiece is the huge, yet still not long enough, historical novel, Hild. And I say not long enough because I cried when it was over. Oh. Um, happily. We're getting more. So oh, yeah. talk, tell, tell the folks about that, won't you? Um, I was working on the sequel to Hild, which is called Meanwood, before I wrote Spear. And I was having a bit of a hard time with it. I was struggling a little bit. Because I kept thinking, ah, if I keep writing her life at this rate, this book's going to be a million words long. And I kept getting really twisted up and, and having to stop and try rethink the story I was telling. But then um, I started to write Spear and I wrote it in such a fury. I mean, I wrote, I wrote the first draft of this whole book in 17 days. It just roared out it was clearly I've been waiting years to write it and I had no idea it just rushed out and it was a complete joy to write I just I never hesitated for a second I didn't stop and think it was just boom, straight out and the minute I finished it I set it to one side and went straight back to Meanwood because now I was fired up now I thought I don't give a shit how long this book goes I know what I'm doing, it's gonna be awesome. And so uh, in that year, I wrote Spear and I finished Meanwood. I wrote 200,000 words in a year. I have never worked at that pace before. <laughs> and um, so Meanwood is a very long book. Meanwood is 30% longer than Hild. Mm. 
So it is, right now, the draft is 268,000 words. So it's um, five or six times as long as Spear. That's a very short book. It's a very big book. And Moonwood is essentially done. I have to do a few tweaks, but it should be out this time next year. Yay. Mm. That is excellent news. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, someone asks, are we going to have a tale about Talarkan's sword being repaired? And this is back to Spear now. No, in a word. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's a bad luck sword. It, it never helped anybody. And it, uh, it, it's not something, it, it's something to sort of, set aside and thank for its service and, and call mm -hmm, it good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but no. Uh -oh. And the sword uh -oh. is not, not Paratir's weapon. I mean, Paratir, right. Paratir likes her spear. I mean, that's that's mm. what works for her. It's what feels like home. So I guess then the... Um, I guess the question that I sort of hesitate to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is... Would you revisit this version of the round table, which I don't think is even round? I think I think it's safe to say I am probably going to do a bit more with the, with a couple of the characters. Excellent. That's because you know, Paratir at least is going to live a very long time. <laughs> so, and it's hard to know what to say because I don't want to spoil right. the ending for that, people right that's why that's why i, I mean really yeah. we're talking about revisiting the this mm -hmm. set having gone to the trouble to work out this elaborate setting yeah and um, and um for those who have not read the book yet it doesn't end where many arthur books ends mm -hmm. it, it because it's not the story of arthur it's the story of peritia yeah. um and it ends with her really finding the place she belongs a place to call home a place where she can be a hero um because that's that's essentially what the story is about it's a, it's about Peritia's search for mm -hmm. connection for home for belonging um and unlike many heroes in the joseph campbell tradition she's not on this one-way trajectory She's not, her journey is not linear. She does in fact go back home, but then we see how she no longer fits there, how much she's changed. And so she goes back to the place that she knows will become home. So yeah, I'm going to stick with Peritia. We'll, I, th I, I think we'll see more of Peritia. Well, and that then brings us around to the the actual, I mean, the other series of yours that we have not mentioned yet, and that would be Al uh, my friend, Al Tervingen. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so, and you are in those books. There is a... There I, is am a, in, I am a character. For those, who haven't read the, yeah. for those who haven't read the Arab novels, um, which starts with the Blue Place, there's a character in there called Eddie who is basically based on Ed. Um, and Ed and Eddie and uh, Aud are, are quite tight. Excuse me, I've got a hair on my face somewhere. Um, and those books are going to be republished soon-ish. I'm really not sure when. I'm hoping late next year, but I couldn't say for sure. They'll be republished by FSG, actually by their paper book back on. So it'll be... Um, The imprint yeah. me. Blanking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they'll they'll be doing it. And for that, I will be writing three new short stories. I think they'll yeah, just yeah. be published as ebooks. So mm -hmm. yeah, but but perhaps I'll also do the audio for them because I do the audio book for Spear. How was that experience? Yeah. Oh, I loved it. It was, um, I've written a, a kind of long essay that's in two parts 
on my blog post for anyone who really wants the process porn, exactly what you do and how you record an audio book. Um, but it, it was a great experience for me. I love reading my work. I, it, it gives me great pleasure. And I have done it once before I recorded my last book, So Lucky. But this time, uh, I got much more pointed direction. So it was great to have a, a, to really be directed. I mean, I've never really been directed. I've never, I've never done any acting. I mean, the, the closest I've come to acting was being in a Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Always what, what horrible. One? Oh, hang on. <laughs> Which one? I was in the Mikado as uh -huh. Yum Yum. So you can imagine how well cast I was for that. Um, <coughs> I was in HMS Pinafore as Jack, which was better. Um, and then I was cast in another, and I just said, I just can't face it. No, I just don't think I can do this again. Mm. So I've never, that's the closest I've come to acting. So I've never been directed. I, I didn't know how it felt. I thought I might not be very good at being directed. I might not take kindly to it. But it turns out that I love it. It's like hmm. being edited by a really good editor. It's like, it's not about, you don't hear the faults, you just hear what you can do better to make it better and more interesting. Yeah. Uh, and so she really helped. She helped me say more energy here or slower here, or no, that voice doesn't sound like the right voice, or let's go back and do the beginning again, and this time make it more like a storyteller by the fire, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So it, it was it was a great experience. And I did it in a community recording space, community arts center, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it was all it was completely <coughs> accessible, brilliantly accessible. It was perfect. Excellent. I'm so glad. Uh I you did you had a previous um uh, I think did you do the Hild? audiobook also did not because it's such a long so book. long that's that's that that would be that's a 24 hour listening experience yeah. and the amount of energy it takes to record is it's mm -hmm. huge and i mm -hmm. honestly i wasn't convinced i would have the stamina for it um i'm i could my voice will hold out recording wise for about three hours mm -hmm. um i think professionals can do it for five or six but i can do three hours at a time i can do three hours a day mm -hmm. and so and it takes many more hours than three to record three finished hours so and given that meme wood is going to be probably 30 finished hours that would probably be a month of going to the studio every day yeah. You know, um, and I'm like, <clears throat> maybe I'll just write something else and get someone else to record that. Yeah. Although, having said that, I I would love to read them. I think, yeah, mm -hmm. so mixed feelings, mm -hmm. mixed feelings about that. Uh, uh, along the lines of listening, um, I was wondering, do you, are you listening to anything when you write? Do you write to music? Ever? Oh, Yeah. What yeah, I have, I have a playlist. Um, uh -huh. Is, is there a Spear then, playlist? It is. It actually, I just used the uh, Meanwood playlist, which uses a lot of the Hild playlist and a few other things. So I have a, a, a Hild playlist. I have a Meanwood playlist. And I have a Weird Hild playlist. So the Weird Hild playlist uh, and some other stuff became the Meanwood playlist, which is just what I used for um, Spear. So it's a real mix of stuff, a real mix of... Um, so that there's a, a stack of, like, there's three or four U2 tracks, but they're not the anthem tracks. They're much more the um, Actung Baby and, and Zoo 
roper tour kind of music mm. um yeah. and then there's lots of old stuff like uh, very early pink floyd um all it is it's all over the map so you stuff. you can actually you can actually write with vocal music only if it's music i know really 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 yeah. really, really 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 well oh, okay. otherwise yeah. no it has to be just instrumental yeah. And in fact, if it's too good and instrumental and I don't know it that well, I'll stop and listen. But I like really, I like, I like my music loud mm -hmm. and I like it rhythmic. And uh, so when I'm really rocking and rolling, no pun intended, I'm really, I'm, I'm rhythmic. I'm like, you know, I go with the music, the typing. Uh, English beat? Is there any English beat on this list? I know you are a big fan. Um, I don't know what English beat is. Uh, it would they would be they for you they would be the beat, but of course there was already oh, a beat in the United oh, States, oh, no. so they became the here they became the English beat. Oh, okay. I'm like I so, don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm no, feeling you, very, no. very uncheated no, no. in my own culture there for a no, bit. No, <laughs> I, I I I know you know because you uh you told me a story about seeing them I think right before the band split up for the first time. Yes. I don't remember. I'm so sorry. Okay, it's all right. Mm. So they're huge, huge favorites of mine. So, um, yeah, that that's my favorite moment from ska. But, um, were you? Do I remember that you were working on some comics adaptation of Aud Turvingen? Did that ever I, I was thinking about it uh, 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 quite a mm -hmm. few years ago. I was thinking about doing basically um YA graphic novel, mm -hmm. basically yeah. about young Oud and, and oh, how, yeah. she, how she came to be Oud. Uh, but actually, no, the closest I've ever come to doing a comic was uh, a few right after Hilt, I was asked to do Wonder Woman. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> And Can I was so, <laughs> so pumped. I was like, yes, I'm going to do Wonder Woman. So I came up with this story and it was awesome. It was, a, it was a way to make the fantasy of Wonder Woman basically be science fiction, but still with mm -hmm. Themyscira and all that stuff and her super strength and I was just so excited. And I sent them the story idea and they said, oh, no. And I said, why? So, well, you know, Wonder Woman's not, I said, can't she even be bi? They're like, no, no, canonically she's straight. And I'm like, you're kidding. She grows up on an island with all the, what, really? You know, none of them have sex ever and they're like nope 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 then they took it up and up and up through the big boss level and and they're all like nope and i said great right i'm not i'm not working for you screw you and then i find out a year later that oh yes! now a boy now! Said she imagine that goodbye. and so of course she is an island so so frosted <sighs> i would oh i would have killed to do that book i think it would have been so cool so hey, um, if anyone out there is listening, yep, I'd love happen. to be Wonder Woman or something even yep. better. Yeah. So, um, I'm seeing some. I'm seeing some. Yeah. Uh, what a loss! Somebody comments here. I couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. Uh, I also see some people wondering if you can read something further from Spear. Do you have any desire to do, or maybe read something from the essay? Is there any part of the essay that might be? Um. You might well, uh, I could. Let me see. What could I? What would be a good thing to read? I could read Someone a little else. bit. Of, or somebody uh, said, "Could you read something from Meanwood if you were in a place where oh, you'd be oh, comfortable oh, doing oh. that?" Mm. Mm, dicey, mm. maybe. Mm. Uh, how about if I just read? Hmm. 
I was going to read a bit from the Red Knight scene, which is like a big fight scene. That's but, such a um, great scene, Nicola. I, I but it, totally... it, it, the scene, the, the, to read the whole thing takes about 12 minutes. What time yeah. do you have? Is that uh, too There's long? about six, not even six minutes, five minutes. Yeah, say. yeah there's just, because it's, it's no good just reading a bit of it. It's yeah. Just, yeah. But it is, it is a stellar scene. It, it's. Mm. Um, I love reading it. It's it's very it's a exciting. knockout sequence. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Um. But, well, in the absence of that, um. I'm what, just seeing if else? I can find Meme Yeah. I don't, I don't even know hmm. where everything is right now. So let me just mm -hmm. see what I can do. <laughs> Excuse me while I just stare fixedly at my screen. Fret not. <laughs> Okay, well, I can read you the first page or two of Meanwood if you would Yay. like. It yes, was, it's please. raw. This is this is raw. This will change. So, mm. okay, on the high moor, Hild listened past the creak of their saddles and the crunch of hooves. Wind steady from the north, hissing like grit through frozen grey and white bracken. The early morning sky was dark as the stony outcropping ahead. The thin, uncanny light was shaped. Uh, this I'm, I'm in the middle of rewriting this, so bits are missing. Um, small saplings had taken hold at the mouth of the gully and the years folk had not felt safe to graze their stock far from others. As new made Lady of Elmet, she would change that. The faster she got more men trained up, the sooner that would happen. Wilfram, riding behind and to her left, called an order, and one of the striplings made a cheerful reply, still cheerful, despite the cold, still proud of their new spears. She glanced back at her hound and raised an eyebrow. Without moving his hand from where it rested near his sword hilt, he gave her the one-shouldered yesith shrug. This was as good a place as any. She motioned them all ahead and stretched in the saddle, thinking. One of the striplings turned to look back, wondering if she would attack them from behind as part of today's trial. Cuthred, light and eager and always ready to burst into song. Well, she would break him of that. Over the rise, out of sight, a peewit's call rose and fell and rose again, fading into the distance. In this world of silvery lichen and snow-dusted rock, the only colour was Wilfram's shield, painted with the white-on-green elmet hazel and purple of her own ifing boar. A gust of wind lifted Signet's mane, and the mare turned to give Hild a mild look. Hild patted her neck. I know. It was too cold to sit out here and think. It was time to begin. She checked her staff was secure and gathered the reins, then paused to watch a throstle's brisk wing beat as it climbed up and up, south and east. It was cold out for such. The world snapped into emerald bright clarity, every grass blade sharp. Not a throstle, a pigeon hawk and not flying low after the peewit, but rising, rising out of danger. There, that's all you're going to get. Well. <laughs> uh, well, we have Wendy um, in, our, in the audience to thank for that suggestion. And thank you, Nicola. That was uh, entirely unexpected and an absolute delight. So, it was very hard. I mean, it's like it was like this document that I've scribbled all over. Yeah. So I'm like trying to see what mm. what's still there. Yeah. Uh, so exciting to um, to renew acquaintance with these women who spring from your mind. Mm. <sighs> mm. 
Nicola, as you as you reminded me before we um, joined the the audience, we've known each other for about three decades now. Yeah. And that is uh, your friendship is is one of the great gratitudes of my of my life. Um, uh, the fact that I get to read your stuff um, is ethereal whipped cream on top. <laughs> Well, thank so. you. you. You've been at so many of uh, my important moments in my life. I mean, for those listening, uh, Eddie pretty much saved my wedding, my first wedding to Kelly. Kelly and I have been married twice, once when it was not legal and then when it was. And we married for the first time in 1993. And there'd been a thunderstorm all night and water was coming down and I I just didn't sleep. I was thinking, our lawn is washing away because we were going to have the wedding in our back garden. And the sod was literally lifting off the ground and floating away. And it was just a bog out there. And all these people would be coming in their fancy clothes. And so at eight o'clock in the morning, I phoned Eddie. I said, Eddie? He said, what? I'm just waking up. I said, just wake up, get up now. He said, what? I said, Go to the hardware store, buy every top you can find. And you're like, what? I said, don't even hesitate. Get there now. And I slammed the phone down. And uh, and bless him, you know, Eddie showed up uh, about half an hour later with all these blue tarps <laughs> that we just had to lay over everything. So we got married on blue tarps rather than the lovely green lawn. But at least it wasn't muddy. So thank you. Oh, the pleasure was mine. I still have, whenever I think of tarpaulin, I have this picture because I think I went to a couple of different hardware stores and the one place I found it, it was, it was as if no one had ever bought tarpaulin from them. It was like dusty on a shelf that was much too large, all folded mm -hmm. up. And it's, oh, you mean this stuff? I said, I'll take all of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then when yeah. guests arrived, I'm like, you, you, you spread those over there. You, I mean, it was like I was just directing traffic. It was yeah. yeah. And 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 I should say too, I, I recently wrote a poem about matrimony, and I was thinking of that wedding. Mm. Um, because uh marriage is not, and I predict one never knows, will ever be for me, but at least two of the ecstatic episodes in my life I have had at the weddings of friends. And one of those, of course, was at your wedding. Mm -hmm. And I thank you again for that. Thank you. So uh, I think we're at time. So ER, uh, if you'd like to rejoin us. Yes. Um, well, thank you all both so much. This was really lovely. And I know uh, Nicola, all of your fans in the audience are really grateful for for not only um, a reading of Spear, but also a sneak pre sneak peek of the next book. Mm -hmm. Wonderful! So lots of um, good, exciting stuff coming down the pike, which is really great to hear. So uh, Karis, as always, will be celebrating all of that, um, and um, we're just grateful to all of our friends um, who you know, have been fans of yours since your very first book. Um, so for folks who do not yet have a copy of Sphere, you may click this teal button at the bottom of your screen to buy it from Karis. It really does help us when you buy event book books directly from us. Um, you also can buy uh, Dread Isle um, and all of Nicola's other books uh, from Karis. And, you know, of course, tell a friend, buy a copy for the library, all of those things. And I'll be adding this event to our YouTube channel, so you can also go back and watch um, Ed's previous event with us for his book release. Um, so, so check that out. And if there are folks you know who wanted to be here tonight but missed it, let them know. They can just rewatch it right here on this on this platform and on our YouTube channel because we would love for more folks to share and watch this video. So. Thank you both for being with us. Congratulations, Nicola, on another great success. Thank you. And, um, until next time, um, I hope that you both stay safe and well. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Nicola, thank you. Lovely to see you as ever. Okay. Good night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>